We are talking today with Dar Jamal. Dar Jamal is an independent journalist who writes regularly for the Interpress Service, Le Monde Diplomatique, and the Asia Times. His reports have also been published in The Nation, The Sunday Herald, Al Jazeera, Foreign Policy in Focus, The Guardian, and The Independent. He has also been featured on radio as well as television, reporting for Democracy Now!, the BBC, and numerous other stations around the world. His reporting has earned him numerous awards, including the prestigious 2008 Martha Gellhorn Award for Journalism, the James Aronson Award for Social Justice Journalism, the Joe A. Calloway Award for Civic Courage, and four Project Censored Awards. He has spent a total of eight months in occupied Iraq as one of the only independent U.S. journalists in the country and has also reported from Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. And finally, he is the author of the book Beyond the Green Zone, Dispatches from an Unembedded Journalist in Occupied Iraq. Let's start out. I actually had just read that you actually worked once upon a time at Johnston Island, uh, the site of uh, a lot of uh, U.S. nuclear testing. Can you just briefly tell us about that? Yeah, Johnston Island is a U.S. territory about 800 miles southwest of Oahu. And I went out there uh, roughly from 1994 to 1996. I was out there for about 20 months working for a company out of San Antonio, Texas called Southwest Research Institute because this was a company, a private contracting company that was awarded a contract to do air monitoring for a plant that was running at the time that was incinerating uh, uh, obs quote unquote obsolete nerve gas and mustard gas. Uh, Six percent of the U.S. stockpile of quote unquote obsolete chemical weapons was on Johnston Island. And so I worked in a lab doing the air monitoring of the plant out, that was out there uh, incinerating these weapons. And this was six percent of the stockpile. They did finish incinerating it uh, and it took them I think over a dozen years to incinerate uh, six percent of the stockpile. But this was a pilot plant because if this plant could prove that it could successfully and safely do this, then uh, more of these plants would be built at the, uh, I, th I believe there are eight other sites in the U.S. to to get this job done. And uh, they, they made that plant, they, they made sure that plant passed. And now those sites uh, in several of those places are already built and functioning as we speak. But as you said, uh, prior to that, uh, the, there were nuclear weapons launched from Johnston Atoll. And uh, the Department of Energy uh, still maintains, uh, uh, I don't know uh, what the proper way to put it is, uh, contracts or the right to do that again. So they're not doing it right now, but that doesn't mean that they won't resume that at some point in the future. Why did you depart from that job? Uh, I went straight from there to Alaska, so that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of my mindset. Was it, it, I wasn't under a, uh, I wasn't disillusioned enough to the point that when I went out there, I expected the government to be doing this wonderful, great uh, a thing that's so good for the environment. But I did expect, you know, I went out there thinking, look, this is a situation where it's good to get rid of these weapons. I mean, they're horrible things, and if I, you know, if environmentally, it's a good thing uh, for sure. But what what I I saw out there was that there were leaks, there were people being exposed to chemical weapons, and every time that happened, the government would basically just change their criteria of how they defined exposure or, or uh, other ways of hiding these things from happening. Because as, a, as I said, this was a pilot plant, and uh, if, if this didn't pass and they couldn't build these plants at these eight other depots around the country, we're talking mega money. And so they made sure this plant passed, and so that's essentially the nutshell version of why I left. So then after that, somewhere between then and now, you decided to become a journalist in occupied Iraq. Tell us briefly how that came about. Well, I was living up, I had moved up to Alaska in 1996, and that's where I was living uh, when the drumbeat for war against Iraq started in the fall of 2002. And I, I was spending summers working uh, as a mountain guide and rescue ranger on, on Denali, and then uh, doing social work in off season, and a little bit of journalism, uh, freelance journalism. I've always loved to write. and. I decided to go and do the crazy thing uh, of going from Anchorage to Baghdad uh, because I felt the the way then uh, the same way that so many people feel today. It's like, well, 
whatever I'm going to do, it's not going to make a difference, or what can I do? I'm frustrated. I see all this horrible stuff happening, and I don't know what to do about it. And I, I felt that way month after month after month, and that became more acute uh, the closer the war became. And then after the protests of February 1503, of seeing millions of people across the world brushed aside as a focus group, I had just decided uh, basically I'd, I'd eaten enough crap from my government, and that I was angry, and I was pissed off, and I, I was I was tired of eating crap, and I decided I wanted to try to do something to make a difference. And so, I've always, like I said, I always love to write, and I I, I des definitely wanted to go to Iraq and see for myself what was happening, and decided one thing I could do was to go over there and and write about what was happening. And and so that's why I decided to go. And I think that if people simply get creative and and follow what's in their heart, that uh, instead of asking the question of well, what should I do? They, they probably already know. And I have to imagine you weren't running into a lot of other corporate media, U.S. media or, or otherwise, while you're doing this. No, I was staying at a hotel where there were other foreign journalists and some independent journalists from the U.S. Because at that point, uh, there weren't car bombs, or it, it, if there were a few, but they certainly weren't targeting journalists and, and, and Westerners, uh, only occupation forces. And uh, we, we were all staying at the same hotel. So I did, I did run into other people. And then it was to give you an idea of how much things have changed from that first trip. We're talking about November 2003, where we could go around and share interpreters to keep all of our costs down because we were all operating on uh, extremely low budgets. And we could walk around and take taxis by ourselves and go out to eat at night, which all of this would be completely unheard of today for a Westerner to do, especially in Baghdad. But there were a few others. But certainly, uh, I, I never ran into any corporate media journalists unless I went into the green zone. So in addition to your website, your book Beyond the Green Zone actually has a lot of your dispatches going back and, and kind of giving the full picture. Would that be fair? It does, yeah. It, it goes fairly chronologically where the book goes back uh, to this is how I got into Iraq and then this is what I saw and this, this is what it was like when I started working there. And so it does kind of walk back through time. Uh, and chronicle um, what I saw, what happened, and kind of the different events uh, as far as how I went from basically just sending emails back home to actually working as a journalist, and then how did I go back a second time? Yeah, because it was kind of a, a natural evolution that was certainly not planned. I mean, people will ask, well, you know, I want to do something like that. I want to get into independent journalism. Independent, independent journalism. How can I? How can I do that? And and I, you know. I, I, all I, the best I can say is follow your heart because that's what I did and I certainly didn't have a plan. I had no intention of even, even going back a second trip, let alone third, four, writing a book and you know sitting here talking to you today. It was just never in the agenda. I was just going to go one time because I, f I felt that if I at least went above and beyond and did that, that I'd be able to go back to Alaska and sleep a little better with myself at night, knowing that I had done something else to try to to bring awareness to this situation. And uh, um, needless to say, I'm still doing it, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's been a pretty amazing trip for me. Um, but I think it just shows that, you know, I, I didn't go to journalism school. I don't have any special credentials that, that anyone else um, lacks. I just decided I want to try to do something about this. And, and, and my, my thing is focusing on the media, that, as you know, that uh, this, this administration, as we now see in the wake of all this Scott McClellan stuff, that this administration could not have pulled this off without a complicit mainstream media. And so uh, the work continues. So one of the reasons you did this was so you could sleep better at night. Can you now sleep better at night from the things you've seen and reported on? Well, that's a that's a different <laughs> a different issue entirely. Because uh, at least from a work standpoint, yes, I, I feel like I have I am doing my part uh, to uh, bring awareness to the situation and try to. Uh, have uh, more Americans uh, more properly informed about what's happening, but then the other issue would be PTSD. The, the bottom line is anybody that goes to Iraq, and I say this in the wake of the regional winter soldier event that was at Town Hall this past Saturday that you and I were both at, and 
talking to the veterans there and uh, hearing their testimonies as well. And then, of course, post-traumatic stress disorder being such a huge issue where we had testimony from the, the head doctor of Physicians for Social Responsibility talking about that with just with soldiers. And I think this applies to journalists as well because journalists are just as affected by PTSD, get PTSD just as much as, as combat troops. And that of all the, the people serving in Iraq, and there's been over a million now soldiers cycled through Iraq, that one-third of them have PTSD, one-fifth of them have uh, a, a traumatic brain injury, meaning from concussions of bombs from the airwaves uh, and, and differences in atmospheric pressure. And then uh, I, I believe it was another, at minimum one-fifth uh, suffer from severe depression. So when we add all those up, you're looking at uh, basically between three and 500,000 people that are back after having been in Iraq that have either severe depression, PTSD, or traumatic brain injury, or two of the three, or all three. So it's, 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 it's really astounding to look at it through that lens. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people coming back home that are, are uh, really, really suffering. And, and I fit in that category. I mean, when I came back, uh, and actually I remember talking with you, it was probably two or three weeks after my last trip in Baghdad, and I came up to Seattle to give some talks. And I was definitely in, in PTSD, where interrupted sleep, nightmares, uh, feeling emotionally numb, uh, or, or, or the only other feeling was, was rage about what was happening, and then lack of uh, appropriate reaction back here from the population. And I've had to deal with that. I've had to see a counselor and, and talk about it and, and continue to need to keep tabs on that because you don't, as a human being, go into a war zone and see atrocities and see bodies and horrible, horrible things and interview families that have been completely destroyed or wiped out from bombs or other types of violence and, and uh, remain the same the rest of your life. It's just impossible. And I think if you ask any, any combat veteran, like the, the folks we heard testify last weekend, uh, they're going to tell you the same thing. And, and if they're not going to tell you that, you can look at them and see that, you know, this person's been deeply affected by that. And uh, you have to deal with it accordingly. And I think that this is, I mean, th and this is a story that has gotten some coverage, even in the corporate media. But when we look at just the sheer numbers, I mean, this is a story that when we look at the people coming back from Vietnam and how many there are, because another thing that's important people need to keep in perspective is that in Vietnam, people that were drafted, uh, you only had to serve one tour. You could volunteer and do others, but but you had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people serving in Vietnam that only had to do one tour. We've had guys going over to Iraq for seven tours. I mean, the average now is three to four tours. Certainly, lots and lots of people are doing two. So how does that stack up psychologically? And we talk about PTSD and people coming back home, um, f you know, not just physiologically, uh, but, but psychologically severely damaged and needing help. And how is this going to play out through time? I mean, this is, this is a huge, huge story that while it's gotten some coverage, I, I, we're just at the very beginning of this. Yeah, we were talking before we started about uh, what they cover on the corporate news at night, and one of the things that's come up, it has been mentioned uh, briefly in some of the corporate media, but not on the front page where it should be, is the static, oh, and I hate calling it a statistic, is the reality that on average 18 soldiers are killing themselves or committing suicide every day, and you don't see that mentioned on the nightly news about how many soldiers today killed themselves. That's a that's a very important point, and I'm I'm glad that you brought that up because the Pentagon will not refute when when this report came out, and the Pentagon will not refute it. We've had more soldiers in the U.S. military commit suicide than have actually been killed or died in Iraq, and we're coming up on 4,100. So at least that number plus a bit more have committed suicide in addition to that. And again, so already we're talking about upwards of almost 10,000 deaths, not coming up on 4,100, but uh, upwards of 10,000. And then when we talk about wounded, I mean, it's, you know, the Pentagon now, I think they claim some absurd number like 25 or 30,000, something like this, wounded. Well, they, and I remember the day they did it, they readjusted their criteria to define what, what is wounded. I mean, just like what I said happened on John 
Johnston Island. Like, well, these statistics are a bit too damning. We need to we need to uh, change this up so it doesn't look quite as bad. And that's essentially what what they've done. Where. They 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 uh, redefine the parameters so that uh, the number I remember when they did it the number of, of wounded and casualties was up over fifty two thousand and when they did it it dropped down to just under thirty thousand so we're looking at a false number but again uh, just just with psychological injuries alone I mean one third of the people that have been cycled through Iraq of having PTSD just with that alone we're looking at over two hundred thousand. PTSD. I mean, that is a casualty of war. And then when we add in the physical uh, casualties and then battlefield casualties and all of this, I mean, we're getting upwards of, of uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, not 30,000. Well, and just again with the numbers for PTSD, if the reports are accurate, and I believe they are, of the different soldiers who have been reporting at the winter soldier hearings the ones that work in the VA and have been told by upper management in the VA to not uh, recognize different people coming through as having PTSD because they don't have the infrastructure to be able to handle that then the numbers have got to be I mean I don't know of what magnitude higher but certainly the, the arrow would be pointing up Absolutely, absolutely. And, and yeah, all these figures I'm putting out there, my, my source is the Veterans Administration itself, if anyone wants to, to check. And as you said, that I believe it's according to the VA, it's a minimum of 20% of the soldiers coming back have, have PTSD. And then there's other sources that put the number far, far higher than that percentage-wise. But certainly, again, when we talk about these statistics, uh, you know, we, and when we talk about casualties, I mean, how many of these statistics include drunk drivers? Driving fatalities, or uh, you know, domestic violence, or barroom fights, or I mean, we can go on down a long list of of other things that aren't really being measured because they're so. I don't even know if it's possible to measure all of this stuff, but but certainly the fact that it's coming from the VA, um, who, as we know, has been caught red-handed trying to hide the number of suicides, where actually the number was going to come out, and there was a memo that was released internally from within the VA. It was leaked out to the media of someone saying no um, we need to just we need to make sure that people don't hear about this um, so that kind of thing so in that climate is 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 where we're getting a statistic of conservatively one out of five people coming back have PTSD just for starters so uh, I think it's safe to say the number is far higher than that so I believe you're working on a new book. You have one in progress, and that is focusing on what? On resistance within the U.S. military to the occupation of Iraq. Uh, we've, we've heard a little bit about this, where more and more people, uh, soldiers specifically, are disgruntled about what's happening. Uh, many of us uh, have, have been aware that morale is very low. I mean, there was a, a, poll, a Zogby International poll that was released in February 2006, where they sur surveyed all the troops in Iraq and found that, I believe it was 71 percent reported either low or very low morale, and that all, all U.S. forces should be withdrawn in, uh, within a year's time, and that was in February 2006. Things are worse now. Uh, we have a situation where across the board morale is low. It's you're hard pressed to find units, and there are still some units over there that, excuse me, that believe in their mission. But you're pretty hard pressed to find uh, find that. That's that's definitely the exception and not the norm. And so as a result, you've got a, a very demoralized military. As, as we talked about before, many of them are over there on this, at least their second tours, sometimes their third and fourth tours. And so they're literally in survival mode, where one of the things that keeps soldiers going back, I think the primary reason why someone would serve in Iraq and then go back again is because they feel an obligation to protect their buddies, that they don't want to leave because they they would feel guilty if they left their unit and then something happened and oh I could have been there to protect my buddies and they, they don't want to betray their buddies that that loyalty which which is to be respected I think um, is is what keeps people going back and so uh, in that climate we have a situation where what I've been finding in my book is there's uh, we've all heard of search and destroy missions in the US military well uh, 
they're called search and avoid missions. And this is not a new thing. This was rampant in Vietnam as well. But basically what's happening is people are over there, morale is very low, and they said, look, we don't really believe in this mission. Uh, our CO is sending us out on these bogus patrols in these really hot areas because if we get into combat, he gets a medal even if he's not with us. I guess that's how you become General Petraeus. But it's my point is it's not good for morale. So they're going out, and I interviewed, I came across this on book tour for Beyond the Green Zone. I was up near Fort Drum in New York, which is where the 10th Mountain Division is based. And I was interviewing an active duty soldier, and he said, yeah, we did these search and avoid missions. We would go out on our patrol, we'd go to the end of our patrol route, we'd find a big open field, ideally under some date palms, park our unarmored Humvees, and we'd sit there and we'd listen to music, we'd drink soda, we'd smoke cigarettes, and pretend. And we'd call in every hour to base and say, yeah, we're still searching the field for weapons caches. And we'd do that for 8 to 12 hours, or however long we were supposed to be out, and then we'd go back home. And he said, we'd do that every other day. And, I, and a little bit later, I interviewed another guy, also active duty, different part of Iraq, totally different year of the occupation, same exact story. And then I interviewed a guy who worked, uh, Jeff Millard, who worked uh, as, a, as a secretary for a general, and his job was monitoring communications and reporting and responding to SIGAC, significant uh, activities or significant actions, basically when a unit uh, encountered violence. And he said that, yeah, we knew that units were doing these search and avoid missions because we had units in places like Tikrit and in parts of Al Anbar province, which at the time were extremely hot, the hottest areas in Iraq, and and uh, they would they would go six, seven, eight months and not report one SIG act. That's like a physical impossibility. So my point being is that this is rampant. It's going on today as we speak. I interviewed more troops just a couple of days ago uh, uh, that were talking to me about other new and creative and inventive ways of also doing search and avoid missions, but I'm going to save that for the book. Uh, and then there's others like uh, AWOL. There's been 80,000 troops go AWOL so far since the war started. We don't hear about that very much, do we? That's a lot of people. Uh, the military is basically being held together by duct tape today, where there's a reason why there's more contractors now in Iraq than there are members of the U.S. military. And a lot of that is because if I'm a soldier serving in Iraq and my morale's low and I don't like the way I'm being treated and I just finished my contract, well, it makes more sense for me, rather than rejoining the military, even with a twenty or $40,000 signing bonus, if I can go work for Blackwater now and make 10 times the money, have real benefits, really get taken care of if, if I get wounded, and be able to leave at the end of two months if I want to instead of two or four years and not be jacked around by the military. So uh, the military is hemorrhaging troops, uh, but most are leaving. Most aren't even going to the contractors. Most people, the biggest part of this resistance is kind of an unspoken, quiet resistance where people are basically finishing their contracts and then just walking away, just washing their hands like, I don't want any part of this war, I don't want any part of this military, I feel like I've been screwed over, not taken care of, not supported. I just want out. And that's what's happening. And that's why the military is not making recruiting goals. Suicides are at all-time high levels. Uh, it's hemorrhaging troops. And, and uh, this is a huge, huge story that while we've had a little bit of reporting on it, uh, that's just the very, very tip of the iceberg. You have to wonder with the search and avoid missions that are happening, if that if there's a correlation between that and the uh, supposed reduced number of U.S. casualties that they're reporting on the nightly news. I think it's significant enough so far with the, the more I dig into this specific topic, the search and avoids, I think it's significant enough that that is playing a role in why there's so, so um, many fewer American troops being killed, where this is happening every day. I know for a fact right now as we speak, Every single day in several places around Iraq, these search and avoid missions are happening as compared to maybe a few years ago when uh, they were rare. They were happening then, too. I mean, they were happening from the very beginning, but they were, they were quite rare in comparison to the level that they're at now. It's rampant, uh, as, as is things like people literally just not doing their job. I, I've talked to people that said, yeah, my job was monitoring communications for the military, listening to cell phone calls, this kind of thing, and I just got completely demoralized, didn't believe in the mission. Our tours kept getting extended. So the last four months of my tour over there, I just 
got really good at Xbox games. I became really good at Tiger Woods Golf. Or I got really good at playing the game Halo. That I just quit doing my job and I would go in and play Xbox for eight hours. And that's what I did for the, and then that's rampant too. And you don't really hear about these types of resistance, but that is GI resistance, where literally, how does a military function in Iraq when you start to have people that won't rejoin, that are doing fake missions, that are calling in sick, that are becoming conscientious objectors, that are not doing their job and not telling you about it? Well, the answer is, is it starts to not function, and I think we're already seeing that. And that seems to be one of the big stories that never was really reported in uh, our history books or in corporate media in terms of the Vietnam War, that the real resistance really started and came from the soldiers themselves. That's a key point, and, and I think that's why I'm, uh, it's very interesting working on this book at this time because it's, it's, uh, it's just starting, and it's going, it's, but it's increasing very, very rapidly. I mean, most people in the U.S. aren't familiar with what happened in Vietnam. Uh, this wasn't that the government all of a sudden got a conscience and pulled out, or it wasn't only because of the anti-war movement here, and it wasn't only because of the Vietnamese resistance. It was three main things things contributed to the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. It was first and foremost, I think, a very fierce, unrelenting Vietnamese resistance. It was definitely a, a vibrant anti-war movement here. And then, just as importantly, uh, I think a close second behind the Vietnamese resistance is there was a GI resistance within the U.S. military, whereas by the end of that war, half the troops on the ground wouldn't follow orders. At one point, during Vietnam, there were 14 aircraft carrier groups that the U.S. had. At one point in Vietnam, particularly when they really uh De started decreasing the ground forces and increasing the use of air power, there were two of those 14 aircraft carrier groups were offline from GI resistance sabotage, literally. So one-seventh of the aircraft carrier fleet were taken down just from GI resistance alone. Um, it was a huge, huge resistance. Uh, people were using drugs regularly, smoking pot, uh, doing heroin, uh, uh, drinking alcoholically, just literally, you know, fraggings were going through the roof, just not following orders. And we're not, we're not seeing an overt type of resistance like that now because we don't have a draft, but instead it's more covert, and that's where, you know, search and avoid missions are, are rampant. I mean, those existed in Vietnam, but in Iraq they're extremely popular. Uh, sick calls, uh, going in and playing video games instead of doing your computer work. I mean, these types of more covert resistance. Um, so it's, it's a different type of resistance, but uh, so far what I'm seeing, and especially when we look at, when we factor in the PTSD, and the traumatic brain injuries and the depressions and what's happening to troops when they come back home and how they're not getting the care they need. And troops in Iraq are acutely aware of that, believe me. When we factor all of this in together, we have um, a situation that's very ripe for GI resistance, which we have, and uh, I think is going to grow uh, astronomically over time. And uh, other groups back home like Iraq Veterans Against the War reflect that. I mean, we had uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War is an organization that had about 800 members when their winter soldier event happened in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, the middle of March. Uh, they've, they've increased their membership 50% from that day to now uh, by, by over 400 people. And the fastest growing segment of their population are active duty troops. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. In addition to your book, Beyond the Green Zone, how, uh, where else can people turn to to find your writings? I do have a website. It's dar.org, D-A-H-R.org, and folks can read hard news stories there. I do have uh, consistently new stories being posted from uh, Iraqi colleagues inside of Iraq that are still getting information out, uh, and then a big link section there where folks can uh, check out other news sources as well. All right. And what's the ETA on your book? Uh, the book, I'm working on it right now, and uh, it'll come out sometime in spring 2009. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thanks a lot, Mike. We have just been talking with Dar Jamail. He is an independent journalist writing regularly on issues in Iraq. And again, you can find out more via his book, Beyond the Green Zone, Dispatches from an Unembedded Journalist in Occupied Iraq, or his website, Dar, D-A-H-R dot O-R-G.